Welcome to the debut episode of Wampa Radio. My name is Matt DeMarco, a.k.a. Flake, and on this program, Charmer and I are going to bring you all the headlines, all the strategies, all the community discussion surrounding Star Wars Unlimited, which is a new game, a card game, based around our favorite IP. That would be Star Wars. Uh, done by FFG. And uh, again, this is the first time that you and I team up, as it were. Uh, you are the red two to my red one. So welcome welcome aboard. I'm, I guess, happy to be here. I didn't realize I was going to be red two. This red is... two was Wedge Antilles. So first of all, slow your, your roll on this one. The greatest, most dangerous badass in the ever to hold a stick i'm just saying yeah which is exactly why i'm confused you're giving me way too much credit i am likely better suited as a rogue one because i do something heroic and then you never hear from me again <laughs> um yeah this isn't uh the first time you and i have teamed up but this will be our first ongoing project and i'm personally looking really forward to it because you and i are Die hard Star Wars fans. We're die hard card game fans. And I think that this is like if I could pick any project to work on with you, it would be a card game based on Star Wars. It's a dream come true. So I'm so excited. Yeah. Well, this is uh, this is where we get it done. As uh, this is not just going to be about uh, Star Wars Unlimited. I mean, the, 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 the lion's share of it uh, will be, as it were, but uh, we're going to sort of take the scenic route for a lot of this. The Outer Rim territories will be explored, such as Star Wars CCG. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff, Charmer, I think, that you have also played. The books, uh, canon, uh, legends, all that stuff. The movies. We got a lot. Tabletop of RPG. Like, I got the player's handbook still behind me. The old, like, 3-5 uh, edition rules. All, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, if it's Star Wars and like I can play something related to Star Wars, video games, you name it, uh, I have absolutely done it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're probably going to reference some things that are not just Star Wars Unlimited, though that will be the, the main focus. And, you know, to kick things off, to kind of get into that spirit of talking about things not just related to the card game, uh, we have a weekly recurring segment that we are going to be doing, and that is the Wampa Cave Poll. So do you want to run us through what our first week's options were in the results? Yes, so the the first ever Wampa Cave poll, which you can go ahead every week and check out at, at Wampa Radio on Twitter. We put the poll out there usually on a Monday, let it roll until about a Thursday. So we give you a bunch of time to get your answers in. But this week, the question posed to all of you out there, again, we're settling all of the world's hottest debates. This one being... Who is, which character is strongest with a lightsaber? Now, your options were Count Dooku, a.k.a. Darth Tyrannus. You had Mace Windu, Anakin Skywalker, not Darth Vader, not Darth Vader, keep that in mind, and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now, what, how did this one parse out, Charmer? Well, Mace Windu took home the crown they were the most popular choice and i think for good reason out of these four and then after that it was anakin skywalker obi-wan kenobi and then count dooku bringing in uh, last place i think of the four choices i am mostly in agreement here though i will say there are uh, some other characters i would have liked to have seen on this poll but yeah, I think that of these four, this is probably the way that I would have answered it. Yeah, the one thing that, like, the, here's the, the so Mace Windu, by the way, is hands down the number one answer. Um, this was almost like a barrier of entry quiz it, just to, to see where the majority of people who answered this got this right. Mace Windu is, by all accounts, the most fearsome lightsaber wielding Jedi or Sith that has ever existed, as far as I as as my opinion goes, I think that uh, part of it has to do. There are like eight or nine different styles of lightsaber battling. Uh, some of which actually, f you need to kind of like tap into anger and rage and like the dark the dark side aspect in order to master it and to but it's it's also some of the most dangerous it's some of the most powerful it's very offensive it's less defense it's more 
you know, aggression and such. Uh, Mace Windu has mastered that as well, whereas most other Jedi don't even touch it because it forces you to sort of explore some of the dark side. Mace Windu is like, yeah, screw that, mofos. Um, not only do I get a purple lightsaber, I'm also learning this this other type, which the, the name of the, the style eludes me right now, but it has a specific name. But Mace Windu is the right answer here. And do you remember that scene, Charmer, in Revenge of the Sith when a four-pack of Jedi go to arrest Palpatine? Do you remember what happened there? I mean, I, unfortunately, I do. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is like, okay, so, like we're, we don't need to give spoiler alerts for Star Wars related stuff on this podcast. But what, what made me laugh out loud about that scene is not Ian McDiarmid who played Chief Palpatine immaculately. It wasn't yeah. Mace Windu's badassery. It was the fact that the, the battle starts, the fight starts with Palpatine literally just being like, I ah, stab your dead. Like the first dude, just, and, and the, and the, <laughs> the freaking Jedi that gets stabbed is just like, ah, and then falls. So it's immediately three on one. Like it, doesn't even start and he just well, yeah because you don't fight fair when you're the sith lord right when you're the sith lord mind you the 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 baddie of bads if you will in star wars canon so fearing uh you know or so powerful so full of like fear and hate and whatever that can just resurrect himself into entire new trilogies out of nowhere yeah uh somehow he returned uh he met <laughs> i will call it now if they ever print a card called Somehow Palpatine Returned, I am never playing that card. <laughs> no, I I am going to go on record. Episode one, here we go. I'm going to go on record. We will have a card that is called Somehow Palpatine Returned, and it'll be like you get to play him from your discard pile or something silly like that, but there will be a card <laughs> yeah. that's titled that. It's too, it's too good to not include that at some point and the reality of this is that decipher star wars game a uh, star wars ccg in like the first in like premiere and um and a new hope which were the first two sets the characters they're they're like the way to recover them you had to basically quote unquote retrieve force out of your your lost pile but you didn't get it into hand it, it shuffled back into your deck and whatever and that and but like there was no easy way to recover lost characters, but Star Wars CCG printed a lot of cards that did that. However, they they named a lot of these cards based off of lines from the movie. For example, like right. yeah, if you wanted to recover Obi-Wan Kenobi, you played a card called Return of the Jedi, which was pretty cool or whatever. There was like Han's back, Luke's back, and stuff like that. Uh, there was like Yoda, You Seek Yoda, which like allowed you to tutor or retrieve Yoda. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was exactly as you call it and the rage inducing title of that card being somehow <laughs> Palpatine returned. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. No. It's gonna be a four of in my deck. <laughs> yeah, but it's not even like like I I bet you you just like you don't even play Palpatine. You're like, I will play somehow Palpatine returned. I do not have Palpatine in my reserve deck. You may rage. It, so it will become my one of inclusion in any deck where I'm allowed to include it because we do know that there's going to be some deck building requirements based on, you know, what's been released as far as the, the quick start rules and whatever there are, um, the, the different, uh, icons, right. There's six of them that we know of so far, just from the promotional material. We know that you build around the icons that your leader is tied to, et cetera, et cetera. And we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I will say this, if, I can register that card in my deck list. I will always include at least one of. It'll be my Might Evokes. In a different card game that I won't get, get into, I always included one Might Evokes in any format that I was allowed to, and so somehow Palpatine Returned will become my Might Evokes. It's your titanium bobble for others. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I get well, you. It'll be my pummel, yeah. Okay. But. Um, all right, well, you said it here. So, uh, so he, just to give everybody a little bit of a you know, a little snapshot of what the format of the show is going to be. Um, we, we went through the poll, and um, the other thing about this is what I want to say is I would have probably put Obi-Wan Kenobi above Anakin Skywalker. Now, above Darth Vader? Probably not. Not in his prime. Not, like, even though he did get cut down on Mustafar. But um, all that said, 
We're going to go through the poll. We're going to give you the headlines of what is making news in this particular week when it comes to Star Wars gaming uh, and, and Unlimited, FFG. But we're going to usually focus each episode on a particular topic. Um, it, it might be like a topic du jour charmer, or it might be something along the lines of like, you know, let's let's dig into what organized play looks like. Let's let's break down an anatomy of the card, the identities and whatnot. But this episode is different. Yeah, this episode is different because it's all headlines. Like that is the meal because <laughs> that's all we have right now is press releases. Perfect timing. Uh, like look at the really. shirt I'm wearing yeah. right now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I I was eyeballing. I was like, well, I have to sneak that in there. Yeah, I think that this is essentially going to feel like a headline show because it's been a lot of press release stuff. And while there are some rules and at some point I, I do want to dive into them, I don't want to go too into the weeds yet because there is, uh, I think a lot of just baseline foundational information that we need to cover. And as a result of that, we are going to have a, a bunch of headlines here. Also, I just want to get this also on record right now. I think that next week's poll should be, who is the strongest non-Jedi character to have wielded a lightsaber? Because there are a lot of instances of non-Jedi using lightsabers uh, in canon entirely, but just like even in film. And the thing that got me thinking about it is because the upcoming Ahsoka show that I'm very excited for, uh, the new teaser showed Sabine using Ezra's lightsaber because he, he left that behind. And Sabine's one of my favorite characters. So I was like, oh, yeah, there's actually, you know, like Finn has used the lightsaber. Even Han used it on the, the Tauntaun. So I, I think that that might be a good poll for this next week. That's a very that's a very good one, because if it's like who is the most iconic or what's the most iconic use of a non force wielder with a lightsaber? A lot of people are going to think it's Han on the Tauntaun. You know, uh, I, I, that's not what I would have guessed. I think the most iconic one is General Grievous doing the windmill. Oh, that's a good one too. You know what? All right. So that might there's be, the a, that's what I'm saying. There's a lot of really interesting non Jedi lightsaber uses that people can tap into. Din, Din Djarin with the dark saber. Well, I wasn't counting that cause that's not technically a lightsaber. It's a dark saber. Oh, you're th okay. Well, uh, you know what? You're, you're not wrong. We can kind of throw that out there but uh the other one would be finn yeah I, yeah i said that earlier yeah. yeah finn definitely is there there's there's a actually a fair amount there's a bunch but uh we'll we'll, 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 we'll talk kick about that around yeah, pay we'll... attention to twitter that's what i'm trying to say here promote the twitter I follow dig it. participate in the poll and right. then uh, we're going to move to the headlines. All right. So the headlines is basically the entire episode this time because of precisely what Charmer mentioned. And uh, But uh, moving forward, we're going to have more robust discussions about more specific things. However, let's talk about what we know about Star Wars Unlimited as it were. It's a uh, ga new game by FFG. And uh, the release date so far is all we know is 2024, which is leagues leagues away it is literally it's a um couple hyper hyperspace jumps away from where we are now uh, we don't even know if it's q1 q2 my suspicion is it's probably a late q1 like an early spring late winter kind of thing i have i have similar feelings to that as well just because i think that it would be it would feel very weird if they were releasing as much information about the game as they are right now, if they were targeting a mid or late 2024 release, right? Like this is the kind of, if I'm being honest, like this is the kind of PR push out that I would expect like a few months away from release, mm -hmm. right? So I think it's quarter one is a good bet again we don't know for sure, right? But I think quarter one is a, a good bet based on what we know from all of the information they have released so far. And beyond that, it's also like, this seems to be kind of what a lot of new card games are doing. Like we saw Lorcana do this. Lorcana spit out that it's coming. Like, I think it was at the end of last year, like mid to, or sorry, late 2022 or September or October, 2022 is when they're like, Hey, get ready. Uh, something's coming. And everybody was like, wow, that's so long, like long into the future that what do we care right now? But that was actually incorrect. Um, and just the well you know you bring up a good point and so this is actually why i was saying it's surprising that we know as much as we already do about this game because lorcana was announced 
but then they kind of went back into hiding. They were like, hey, we're making this game. Here's some sample cards or whatever. But we didn't have rules. We didn't have like any expectations, uh, n- no info about organized play, none of that. Whereas, you know, now we're looking at this Star Wars Unlimited and we have quick start rules. Uh, we have far more cards revealed for this game than Lorcana had up until like April, really. Uh, we've got organized play info that we're going to dive into probably next week. Like there's just so much information uh, again, already out there for this, that I I'm very surprised that it's even at a minimum six months away, right? We're only in June and we know many major pieces of the puzzle. Agreed. And I mean, we don't have to get into some of the nuts and bolts of what's going on with Lorcana currently, but a lot of this is like, they're, they're not afraid to say, here's our rules. Here's our, here's some of the cards go nuts. Um, Lorcana did drop at like their D23 event, like their Disney event. They dropped like you were able to go to some of these events and get like a, a, a six pack of cards or yep. a seven pack of cards to ju- and then people kind of people's minds blew up of like, what does this all mean? Um, I think in in an, in like we're gonna dig into the the card anatomy, our theories about what how the interactions are gonna work in future episodes because right now we don't have enough time, frankly, in a, in the first episode to really devote the time that we want to dig into this because I know that prior to us recording, we were sending each other messages and talking and saying like this is very eerily similar to this, and this reminds me of this, and this is probably how this works. So there's yeah, a lot of familiarity here. <laughs> there's there's stuff that I didn't even send you where I'm just like, hey, I've played enough card games for a long enough time that I recognize like when you leave yourself a space from a design perspective where you do something and it looks very vanilla. But it's done on purpose because that means later you can do X, Y, or Z to interact with it. So I'm actually really looking forward to when we do dive into the cards. But we don't have enough time this episode. No. Uh, that's going to take an hour probably just for me yeah. by myself, not even <laughs> counting you. It's like, so, all right, and that concludes 38 minutes on just yeah, Tarkin. Yeah, yeah definitely. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be my opening salvo. And then at the end, I'll be like, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Now let's start the episode. <laughs> but... Well, the, um, we do know that the first na- set is named Spark of Rebellion. Yes, we know that. Uh, it's on the promotional material. Um, they have also released some art. Uh, this is not in our show notes, but it's, I think, a good time to mention this again of things that we know about the game. It's all original art. That's another thing that I'm really excited about. So if you played any of the other Star Wars games, whether it was like Young Jedi or the old Decipher game, a lot of the cards used scenes direct from the movies. And that was really cool because obviously those scenes are iconic, but it also meant that it was, you know, rehashed material, right? You didn't really start getting um, original pieces until they got to the expanded universe stuff where then we got, you know, uh, somebody kind of dressed up like live action Mara Jade and some of those other characters, but there wasn't a lot of like original substance there. Whereas we know for this game, it's all going to be brand new art specifically for a final fan or a fantasy flights game. Now to me, that's a big deal because that is investment in the game. If you are not familiar with how card games work, art is very often the most expensive piece of putting your game together. I know it's not often thought to be the most expensive piece, but it is between paying the artists, contracting them, doing the back and forth you're kind of creating how your world is going to feel and yes we all know how star wars feels but doing all of that from scratch tells me that they are invested in this game yeah i mean just getting some like i I tried to get a quote from an established artist like an, an artist who has art printed on flesh and blood cards uh a wonderful artist and basically you know, we have a friendly relationship and I said, I'm like, don't, don't try to, you know, give me, cut me a deal here. I said, my goal is I want to put your art on like a play mat. Like I want to, I want to commission you to do it. And I said, just give me the same deal that you would give anyone else. And she gave me a price and I was like, dear goodness. I said, I'm like, out of curiosity, this versus like a card. She's like, oh, this is like a fraction of what I charge for you know, somebody who wants to actually print this on a thing. But um, 
I don't like I, I liked the scenes from the movie being on the cards themselves. Like it was because sometimes, for example, like in Star Wars CCG, you'd get a card of a random rebel scout that landed on Endor and they are maybe in 0.7 seconds of the movie in the background. And the decipher at the time would like hone in on that scene Zoom in, enhance, 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 and then suddenly this random extra from the movie is now immortalized where they know the name, the background, they have all this stuff. Now, that isn't to say that, like, the art on this is not awesome. I actually kind of dig the cartoony, more comic book-esque look to it, which is pretty rad, um, because this gives a little bit more freedom for interpretation, but it also allows the uh, FFG to sort of go out of the bo- like the the boundaries of the movies and everything that occurred you know and i think that that is that opens up a lot of room so the reason that i really like it is twofold one what you just said it allows you to kind of go outside of the established films so when the decipher star wars card game came out obviously there was very limited visual properties that you could lean into or building your card game, building your universe. Now, the amount of content that's available between Disney Plus and movies and uh, TV shows, right? We had Clone Wars, we had Rebels, uh, we've got stuff like Mando. All that stuff is there, and you can lean into all of that as well, but it's not a cohesive thing if you're taking scenes, right? So if you're thinking about like the gameplay experience and you're trying to kind of live that fantasy as you play through the game, if I'm playing, you know, a CG generated card of Ahsoka from Clone Wars next to something from the original trilogy, you know, next to Grogu from The Mandalorian, like it it could kind of take you out of that immersiveness of it being a singular, like coherent world. So uh, I do really enjoy that it is allowing them to kind of go across the, the spectrum there. Uh, But then the other reason that I like it is because they can also lean into some of the characters that are just not in the films or the TV shows or whatever, uh, if they want, right? Because we know that there is uh, a lot of comic book lore, written book lore, and a lot of things that have kind of happened off screen that I think a lot of uh, diehard fans would be really excited to see finally visualized as well. I want to see what a card of Babu Freak would be just kind of like this you know mechanic dude that just fixes things like on his own he's not powerful but with all his little gizmos he's just like this like mini iron man going around saying oh you know (laughs) that was i think that that made me laugh equivalent I, i was just gonna say i want the equivalent of like a counter spell for this game where it just stops your opponent's action, but I just want it to be, I have spoken. Oh, that's actually pretty pretty rad. Um, or it's just C-3PO saying, I'm sorry, I randomly can't translate this language for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> How did that happen? Uh, all right. So we know that the first uh, set's going to be named Spark of Rebellion. Does that kind of give you any indication of like what the theme's going to be? I think it's going to be... Like we've seen some of the characters, we've seen. I, I think I genuinely believe that this is just a, a new hope oriented um, set, and this then kind of leads me to believe that we're going to see much like Star Wars CCG did. It's like we're going to see a Hoth related set that has going to a lot of you know. We're going to see a Cloud City. Uh, I don't know if they're going to go like movie to movie, but in reality, if they do go, like people might think, hey, if you go movie to movie, you're going to run out of movies really fast. Are you? They're still spitting them out. And there's still the expanded universe of, like, you could have a Mandalorian set. You can have a, um, you know, you can have an Andor-related set, which is, like, more so, you can call it, like, spies and and politics or something like that. Like, there's all kinds of fascinating things. But to me, this just just reeks of it's a new hope. It's the characters that everybody knows and loves. We're not going to take a risk on this. So, you know, it's interesting that, you say that because while i agree i think it's going to be very new hope feel new hope centric uh or at least original trilogy centric for this first set i don't think that it's going to be strictly a new hope just because 
Uh, in the quick start rules that were released, we've already seen some things that were not in A New Hope, right? We've seen a Yoda card teased. Uh, we've seen one of the like bases is actually a uh, Cloud City location, one of the base cards. So they're at least giving us a little bit more. I do think that they will have themed sets. Um, we know, again, from the announcements, right, as we're kind of covering the headlines, uh, that they are intending to release three sets a year. So they can catch up pretty quickly anyway. Now, again, good news. Star Wars has lots of stuff to lean into. Um, Clone Wars, the TV show, has you know probably multiple sets worth of stuff that you could jam into it. And then we have Bad Batch, and we have Rebels, and we've got, you know, as you said, Mandalorian. We have Ahsoka coming. We've got all of those new projects. We have the new movies coming. We know Heir to the Empire has been announced as a, a film coming in the future, and so on and so forth. We've got nine movies plus Rogue One, if you're just talking about feature films. Uh, we have the holiday special, which I know we try to forget ever existed, but like, let's be honest, it's there. Um, yeah, I, I think that they have got plenty of content that they can lean into. And that's, again, just counting that stuff. I still firmly believe that we're going to get at some point like a Cal Kestis card, right? Mm -hmm. From the uh, video games, because there's a lot of talk about him potentially making a live action debut at some point. Anyway, he's very popular. Um, but yeah, for this first one, I think that they're going to start with at least what I would describe as the original trilogy feel. Not necessarily truly a new hope, even though Sparker Rebellion, again, kind of feels new hope-ish. Um, the fact that we see a Yoda and Cloud City locations, whatever, I just think that this focus is going to be what I'd say is core iconic Star Wars to start. And then I think our first expansion is likely going to be like core prequel trilogy stuff if i had to speculate okay uh gameplay demos are going to be available at gen con gen con is going to be one hell of a card game hub this summer like august yes. is going to be fiery uh it's going to have lorcana as one of them which is probably going to have a well we say <laughs> it's that's kind of up in the air but that's a whole other podcast ultimately yeah yeah i was uh, laughing both at that but also you said fiery because you're up there in canada and i feel so you know, awful, obviously, for the, the wildfires going on. So your choice of words, I was just like, oh, man, yeah, that's you know, got to be. You know what this is? This is legitimately like smoking, non-smoking sections. Like if the people are old enough to actually have gone to restaurants where there's smoking and non-smoking. But like some of those booths were back to back. So the people would just be like, literally Canada is in the smoking section going, <sighs> blowing it behind their back right into your faces. So suck on yeah, it. <laughs> that, that is absolutely what is happening. We're but sorry. Right. We're and, sorry. Um, Gen Con's going to be uh, a huge hit, I think, just for card gaming in general. As you said, Lorcan is there. Uh, Battle Spirit Saga is doing a big event there. And it was recently announced that this game is going to have gameplay demos. So you're actually going to get to learn how to play the game. Now, I don't think product will be available. It's just learn how to play is what's listed on the Gen Con site. But there will be gameplay demos, learn how to play demos at Gen Con. I've already signed up. Uh, I'm taking... Stark, my oldest son, to his first ever big gaming convention this year. And so we're going for Lorcana. We're going for this game and Battle Spirits and all the stuff that we're kind of already playing at home. But I'm excited to get my hands like on the cards, play through the game when August rolls around. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. That's going to be the probably the first major milestone for this game is going to be that event. Um, all right. So. That is most of kind of like your mark your calendar kind of news. We can talk now a little bit about what we know regarding the cards themselves because they have been very forthright in terms of showing us a bunch of cards. You can go to uh, you can go to just like the website, the Star Wars Unlimited website, and just look look up a whole bunch of stuff. The website's very bare bones right now, and it's not very intuitive. Where like you have to go like click on like the news and then click on this and click on that to find where their major announcement, their presser kind of was. But what we do know in terms of card types, the first being the main, the 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 sort of your lifeblood is your base. What do we know about the base so far? Well, the base card is a actual physical card, and I think that's really important. Uh, we know that in the quick start rules. They reference that your base starts at 30 health, but since it is an actual card with a printed value on it, I suspect that this is one of those design things that I will geek out about in a later episode, but I think that we will at some point in the future get specialized bases. 
Uh, if you're coming from other card games like Flesh and Blood, for example, you can think of how your hero impacts your starting health and, and things, right? So uh, there are, you know, base cards, but quick start rules say you start at 30 health and you, uh, you're you trying to destroy your opponent's base. That's how you win the game. So you're, you know, one faction trying to uh, destroy the base of another faction, which really resonates with me as somebody who played a lot of uh, the old uh mmorpg for star wars star wars galaxies uh the pvp in that was literally you would go and like destroy the opposing factions bunkers and it would be just like wild hours long battles and so i'm looking forward to kind of like reliving some of those memories well uh yeah i guess that's that's definitely part of it um the the like yeah, the, like I, when you th- talk about MM, like the the Star Wars Galaxies, I remember reading about this when it was launched. Like this was like what twenty years ago, like a long, long, long time ago. Uh, not in a galaxy far away, but what really intrigued me about that game was in the article I read. I think it was like in PC Gamer magazine or something like that. Was that the elements of the Force were never going to essentially be sort of mapped out for people? It wasn't like a a tree that you can put experience points into it was how you interacted so, with the environment yeah uh as somebody who, again who played a lot well first of all there's essentially two different versions of that game there's what i call launch version and then the revamped one because when world of warcraft came out they started losing players to that and they panicked so they tried to redo their entire combat system to be more like world of warcraft and then it made their game significantly worse <laughs> but when it launched Uh, You're right. If you wanted to unlock a Jedi character, there were a bunch of hidden tasks that you had to do, kind of like Luke going on his journey for Jedi training. You had to find holocrons and then they would give you special quests and you had to like level up certain classes, but not everybody's classes were the same. So you had to do a a bunch of other stuff like it was it was a journey like it took a lot of investment. It wasn't just like, okay, I, I load up, you know, a a Jedi Knight, and then I run into the universe. Like, if you saw a Jedi, it was as rare as seeing a Jedi in the era of, like, A New Hope would have been. Yeah, and that's what kind of actually intrigued me with the game. I was like, oh, like, there's mystery to this. Like, And this was, again, prior to everyone having high-speed internet, so not everyone was able to just Google, okay, do this, do this, do this, do this, which kind of takes away from the allure of the game. But um, the other thing about the bases is that, you know, when you say that they have a printed value on them in terms of, like, a health total, as it were, this is just another balance metric that they can kind of tweak. Because if the base has a particular ability or advantage or or some sort of aura effect or whatnot this opens up the uh, the concept of you know well what if we had a really strong base that just unfortunately like how do we how do we balance this really cool idea we have because if we gave this ability to a 30 a 30 health base then we're 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 just this everybody's choosing it so what if we just knocked it down to like 26 you know that four point edge and for people who are like that's insignificant flesh and blood does it and they do it very well because it's incredible how one or two points of health matter in that game towards the end where you're like so wow. much yeah so those so are much. incredibly important and the other interesting thing again as i kind of talked about earlier i think with star wars in particular the idea of living your fantasy is a very important thing i think that's the reason that you and i fell in love with the old decipher version of the Star Wars card game was because anything that you wanted to do in the Star Wars universe, that card game gave you a way to do it. If you wanted to train to become a powerful Jedi, you could do it. If you wanted to be a bounty hunter, you could do it. If you wanted to blow up the Death Star, there was entire decks for that too, right? This game, by giving you these different bases as well, opens up the opportunity for in the future, for example, being able to blow up the Death Star, right? If you're uh, running a deck and you've got a bunch of X-Wings, for example, and then you queue into somebody who's got a Death Star location or whatever as their base, like maybe you get bonuses, right? Same thing with uh, if you're running an Ewok deck and you're attacking you know, somebody's base on Endor, whatever. Like the ability to live that Star Wars fantasy, I think is gonna be really important for the success of this game. I, I believe that as well. If there's one thing that Star Wars CCG from by Decipher did so well was the there was a cinematic feel to it. Like it felt like you were doing something. Like when you had Vader, you know, and Fett at the cantina, like 
it, you pictured it in your mind. Like, and a lot of the cards were very flavorful that way. And I hope that this is the same way from what we look at and some of the cards that we've seen. I'm getting that feel, which I like. Um, the next types of cards are going to be leaders. Uh, these cards are going to be double-sided cards, as they were. Uh, examples are going to be Luke and Vader. And there's an undeployed leader card, which is basically the card that you start with. It's undeployed. It's in like one. It's like up. Like it's face down, as it were. And then you can eventually deploy these leaders that become units. And I've seen Luke. I've seen Vader. These are your build around almost your heroes. These are the 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 sort of synergistic nucleus to what you're you're trying to do. They're the strongest cards I would imagine in your deck. Um, but they're gonna have. They're gonna be the driving force of of what you're trying to accomplish. So it's interesting you say like strongest cards in the deck because I think that in some cases they will be and in others they won't. I think that that's going to be one of the cool things about how these leaders play out, right? Because the way that the rules share that they function, as you said, when they're undeployed, they're just theoretically hanging out in your base. And so they provide you with these passive bonuses. And then at some point, you will have the opportunity to deploy your leader to the field if you want. So one fantasy is, you know, Vader is sending stormtroopers out. They're not getting the job done. So he enters the fray to do the job himself. And then he's just this really powerful unit. As you said, maybe the most powerful card in your deck. Awesome. I love that. But I could also see, you know, a world later where maybe your leader is Thrawn and you could deploy him, but his passive bonuses are where he shines because he's the tactician, right? Yeah. I think that giving you that opportunity to... Uh, again, play to the strengths of the way some of these characters are in the universe, I think is going to be a really big deal. But yeah, the the leaders, as you said, you kind of pick one to start with and you build your deck around it. Um, very much like, uh, again, if you're coming from Magic, choosing your commander, Flesh and Blood, choosing your hero. I love these character-centric games because they allow you to, you know, pick somebody that's your favorite and latch onto them and, and be a main. Um and so I, I think that this is a, a slam dunk win for them from a design standpoint. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. Um, next up, we've got uh, two types of units, as it were, uh, which also cues into how the game board or the game state is going to separate itself. You're going to have space and you're going to have ground. Those are the two arenas, as they've called it. And then you're going to have ground units and space units. And what we've seen is a card like Tarkin, which is a ground unit for the for the Imperials or, or whatever you want to call it. And then there's what's called the Wing Leader, which is, it's an X-Wing, um, but it's a Wing Leader that is a space unit. What I love about this is that this once again transforms me or transports me right back to Star Wars CCG where space and ground mattered. You couldn't get away with just one or the other you would get punished if you neglected one now some decks completely operated as just being overwhelming in one or the other but i am so happy that they're they're going to basically cut this in half and i'm going to ask you because you played a lot uh, and you were very involved you're casted uh the elder scrolls legends that's mm -hmm. a two-lane game does this give yep. you some of those flashbacks to that it does and I think that there are a lot of things that this game could potentially do better than what the Elder Scrolls Legends did. And then conversely, I think that because of the way that game was designed, it also potentially does some things that are likely going to be better than what this game can do. And the reason I say that is because in the Elder Scrolls Legends, it was a two lane game, but you could play things that allowed your cards to move back and forth between lanes as well. So there were like movement cards that were part of the strategy in this case, because they're very specifically calling out like ground and space. I don't think that you're going to see X wings on the ground very often, but as we talk about playing into the themes of star Wars, I could see, uh, you know, as we start talking about some of the next card types, like events, things that give you bonuses, like it, it will target a ground unit, but maybe you get a bonus. If you also can spot something in space and it will represent like those bombing runs or, you know, like when we see the X-Wings uh, and the ships hitting Scarif in Rogue One, right? Because those are some pretty iconic scenes now as well. So I do think, again, the, the lanes allow you to give you two different places to defend and prioritize. And I think that anytime you provide players with choice and decision making, that's important. But also 
very thematically allows you to interact with each other as well. I like that idea, and I think that that's where they're going for this as well. Star Wars CCG had a card called Close Air Support, which was if you had a Z95 Headhunter uh, at the system where your where your characters were on the on the locations, if you controlled the system with Z95 Headhunters, it allowed you to have significant bonuses on the ground like you you were just because again close air support like it, like the theme is there and the first thing that popped into mind was that but you i think you got it spot on when you said that scene from scarif like i love that scene what that's oh, one of my favorite scenes it's like, so well done they he sh- fires the rocket at the at the walker the walker like it gets blasted in the side of the cheek and just looks him down and it looks like he's gonna get busted up and then the X-Wing just comes in and pounds it. And the reason why I really like the scene is because I think it really put into perspective the sheer firepower of an X-Wing. If a rocket launcher was just brushed off, here comes an X-Wing that two or three blasts just put this thing down, right? And keep in mind, that was Rogue One. In The Force Awakens... When Poe Dameron and the X-Wing squad come in to help and, like, rescue, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the heroes at Maz Kanata's, um, some of those stormtroopers took an X-Wing bolt right to the chest. So, like, yeah, you're out, baby. <laughs> like, you're done. <laughs> yeah, uh, that stormtrooper armor is not that good. It's not all Beskar under there, so... So I, I, I'm liking the sort of division of space and, and whatnot, but I wouldn't be surprised. Like you mentioned, you know, uh, a, a hero like Vader, or that, at least the hero that we, the version we saw or whatever, you know, might be like a ground and pound kind of punish you, Vader. But if you said like the one of the heroes or the villains or, or whatever you want to call them, the leaders that I envisioned as being incredibly unique and, and cool to explore was Thrawn. I, and, and for the reasons that you mentioned, Thrawn is a very sit back, watch, evaluate and manipulate. He's always in control, right? Like no matter what mm-hmm. happens, he always has an out. He always has control. So maybe he's a hero. It's like, you can actually jam him in the chimera or like jam him in a star destroyer. And it's like, if he is piloting a star destroyer, all of your units get whatever. Like when he is in his in his spot, when he's in his place, right. then he gets a bonus. Yeah, that's I, I fully expect, honestly, if he has any sort of deploy at all, because he also could be like maybe one of the first leaders where you just don't even get a deploy, right? But if he does have one, I think he'll almost assuredly deploy like as the Chimera, right? Like he'll just deploy like as the spaceship. It'll be like him driving uh you know his fleet leadership vehicle that then gives a big bonus to everything and yeah i I, again like i'm so excited for this game because there are so many different ways that you can navigate and what i think that this game is doing really well is they're taking a lot of the things that you and i loved from the old decipher game and then they are keeping the themes there but they're also kind of condensing the rules a bit because one of the things that I often got feedback on when I would try to get my friends to play that game uh, was that it was very complex because if you could think of it, you could probably do it in that game. And that's one of the reasons I loved it. It was a card game that was really a role playing game, I think, disguised as a card game. Um, This is going to, I think, have more of a card game feel, but a lot of the same design hallmarks are there. So it scratches that itch for me the i'm calling it now you made it you called out something ridiculous i'm gonna call out something less ridiculous we have leaders they're both ground heroes right now i'm calling it you're gonna have a leader that is gonna be the millennium falcon and you're gonna have a leader that's gonna be the executor that is what i'm calling right now those are gonna be like your first two space leaders where it might be like han solo like han solo in the falcon or it might be you know, uh, Admiral Piet in the in the executor or God knows what. Like, but I I suspect that that is what we're gonna get. If the if you're splitting the board in two, and a leader is a gr- is a unit and then has the mm-hmm. the designation of ground unit, then it leads to believe that you know you should suspect that there's probably gonna be there's enough heroic characters that are like ships. Um, you know, maybe you get the Razor Crest. Maybe you get 
R2 well, in Red 5 or something like that. So th- this is also something, you know, we kind of touched on earlier with the potential longevity of the game. You can say like, well, how do you continue to make sets? Well, this is also part of the answer, right? Just because they've printed a loot card doesn't mean they're done printing loot cards. There's going to be, oh, you know, Luke yeah. as a unit. There's going to be Luke as a, a leader. There's going to be another Luke in an X-Wing, there's going to be maybe even a space leader, Luke, right? And the same thing for Vader and the same thing for X, Y, and Z. So I really feel like... Jedi Luke? This, this could go forever. You, get, you can get Jedi Luke. You can get Tartar Control Luke. You can get a Cherry Diet Cherry Vanilla Luke. There's so many different kinds of Lukes. That you, you can get Luke Dry, uh, Luke uh, Light. Luke Milk? Luke... Blue Milk. <laughs> <laughs> don't uh nonetheless like there's there's so many opportunities um like i kind of wish i was des- designing the game but uh what else we got uh so in terms of card types the other things that we haven't covered yet though we touched on it very briefly but didn't officially mention it so after units uh there are events right these are your action cards uh one of the things that i think is really interesting about the ones that they have kind of shown us thus far is that they, despite being event cards, they also have like keywords already on them, right? So there are ones that are like uh, a tactic, for example. And so I wonder if we're going to see ones that are like tactics or maneuvers or whatever. And then this is also how you can have some of these leaders play into things, right? Because maybe Thrawn is good with tactics because he's the tactical general. And then you might have somebody, if we ever get like a space vader, uh, maybe he's very good with maneuver event cards because he's like one of the best pilots in the galaxy. So I do love that it's not just like, oh, these are just like your generic actions. They have already given depth to these cards. And there's, I think, going to be a lot of decision making that goes into which ones you decide to include. I like it. I do like it. Again, the fact that you can sort of classify them as well, because, yeah, like to me, when you say maneuver, the first thing I think of is han solo in the falcon saying trust me like trust me on this i know what i'm doing like and pull something ridiculous right or like poe doing some of the crazy stuff that he has done or you know it's like the really cool stalls uh mandalorian right he's got the the stall where he drops and then refires the engines just before like there's so many cool things oh i want to i want a card that is that like thermal sort of detonator kind of uh you know like that that like remember the one that you know like boba fett drops it and destroys those ties it's like boom. oh yeah, yeah yeah so the very first time it showed up was uh jango fett right where they executed it beautifully because it's there's like no sound before it hits you know what i mean yeah. like they they nailed the audio for that i I'm with you. That's good. If you guys can, uh, this is what I want to see. In the comments of this video, please try your best to spell that sound. Uh, <laughs> like It's just, boom. I will try to get that sound and I'll try to edit it into this so you guys can kind of get it. But I think that that sound is like, it's one of the most satisfying sounds. And what's awesome is that after watching any kind of episode of whatever, uh, be it Book of Boba Fett, Mandalorian, or wherever that sound is done, if you go to like the, the usually the post episode Reddit discussion threads, people are like, we got it, we got the sound, it's in here, we got it. Like, it's like one of the biggest celebratory aspects of an episode. It doesn't matter what happens. It's like, we got the noise. And I, I dig it. It's a pretty damn good noise. It is ASMR for Star Wars nerds. <laughs> um, last up, I think we got upgrades. Yes. And I I love that they kept this generic. So the card type is just upgrade. But again, much like with the events and and getting those keywords and and so forth, the one that they showed in the uh, previewed quick start rules is Vader's lightsaber. But that is got some additional things. It's an item, it's a weapon, and it's a lightsaber. And it also, in the ability itself, specifically says attached to a non-vehicle unit. So that's also telling us at some point we're going to have vehicles. ATATs. Yeah, so much here uh, that this one card shows off, right? So, yes, you're going to have cards that power up your cards. And that's very cool because we all want to upgrade our, you know, Jedi, give them lightsabers. But even more so with the ships, right? Like, we want to upgrade our ships and give them some cool things, too. Like, yeah, the X-Wings, they've got their blasters, but we also want to fire torpedoes into the Death Star, too. So... 
all sorts of stuff that I think we're going to see in this upgrade category. But as a just generic card type, it's called upgrades. Like if you're not jamming a harpoon on your snow speeder, like are you really doing it right? You know, like and I don't care what's on the other side of the battlefield. I don't care if it's an ATAT if. or or a um, of a, a, or a you know salacious crumb. You fire that bad boy. You tie that bastard up. You 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 make it happen. Like this is why I'm so psyched about this game is because it's already taking me back to doing ridiculous things because <laughs> for the sake of doing ridiculous things in Star Wars CCG. Like I remember the first ever the first ever 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 tournament I've ever played in card games ever. I think I was like 13 years old. I played Star Wars CCG. I brought the dumbest, jankiest, stupidest list, which was um, uh, Masassi Base Operations. It essentially, blow up the Death Star. It 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 was so ridiculously bad. But if you blew up the Death Star, if you actually got all these working parts to fire off and you succeeded, you basically win the game. Like there's no coming back. The the the, the dark side player can't come back from it. It's it's just you're you're too good. But to do that, it's like ridiculous. It's like, it's, you know, it's like trying to put out the sun with a squirt gun. Like, if you do right. it, amazing, we're doomed. Like, you, you, you won, but like, try doing it. But I remember doing it, and again, I got absolutely throttled. Like, the only game I won was against somebody else who had the exact same idea, which was, let's just do something ridiculous. And for them, it was they wanted to blow up the shield generator on Hoth. And I'm like, let's go. <laughs> you know, so that's what I'm feeling with this. Because... And this also alludes to what they said. They are so, so aware that this game will have a competitive um, sort of demographic to it, but they also want to support the casual side of it. And it's so easy to get enthralled in the casual aspect of it when you have things like, all right, you're trying to blow up Alderaan. I'm trying to blow up the Death Star. Let's go. Like, that is, that's what casual fun. It's not about um, optimization of the deck. It's about it's about having a story and and having that excitement. Listen, I, just staying on topic, right? I looked at this Vader's lightsaber, and the first thing that jumped out to me was that it gets a bonus if it's played on Vader, but it doesn't have to be. The only restriction is it has to be a non-vehicle unit. And my brain immediately went to, I can't wait until we get a General Grievous who just says, like, he gets a bonus for every lightsaber you equip. So you're just running all these different lightsabers in your deck, and then he's just picking up Vader's and Dooku's <laughs> and whoever's he's got, right? He's adding it to his collection, and then he just windmills them out. Like, I, again, want to do something ridiculous. You know, you talk about your ridiculous thing. The very first Star Wars Decipher uh, deck that I built where I was just like, I want to do something dumb. My deck was based around capturing somebody with bounty hunters and feeding them to the Rancor. So yeah. in that game, you had to... There was really complex rules for capturing somebody, putting them in the manacles, and then you had to transport them like because they were your prisoner. So you had to take them all the way to Jabba's palace, drop them through the pit, and then the Rancor would eat them. And like you, I think I won one game the first time I played it. <laughs> but that one game was enough to carry me because it felt so good. Yes. Uh, my friend used to do this to me all the time. My friend, um, uh, his name is Jed. He's, I, I grew up, uh, he was one of the people that I used to play Star Wars with a lot. And he used to like to try funky stuff like that. And I'll never forget because his whole thing was capturing my dudes all the time and then feeding them to the Rancor. But I was like, I caught wind of this. So I would try to like go and attack his dudes. And he used to play a card called like Human Shield, where like if I would fire a weapon, he would just like sacrifice my captured dude in front of it. And he'd be like, yeah, you can have him. It's dead. Uh, whatever. I'm like, no. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I want to rescue him. But that's, that's what I can't wait for about this game. Because we haven't touched it. We haven't played it we don't know anything about what about it beyond what has already put out but do you see the joy on our face like can you can you, <laughs> can you like this is i'm so jealous that you get to go to gen con i'm unfortunately going to be well i say unfortunately i am going to be working uh casting a flesh and blood event that weekend but man like it, what a, a, a jealousy factor I have already. I will be texting you pictures. This is the only Realm event I won't be casting this year solely because I said, like, I want to take Stark to Gen Con. But you can guarantee that I will be texting you pictures from our Learn to Play so that uh, you can 
kind of share in the experience. I know that you'll be on the desk, but at least on your breaks, you can be like, oh, like this looks really cool and I will I will do my best. So do we um, we have the mailbag that we're going to get to and mm -hmm. I haven't decided on what kind of like if we have a little bit of a transition effect, maybe a sound bite that leads us into the mailbag. Uh, I've kind of nicknamed it like the the bad feeling ma mailbag because bad feeling there's it's said so many times. But yeah. part of me wants to like I'm gonna probably edit in like a, a I've got a bad feeling about this kind of like montage when we go into the mailbag. But part of me just wants to throw in the <laughs> kind of like explosion noise. <laughs> you know what we should do? Every time that there's a really bad question, we just blow it up with that with that bomb. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> we could do that. Or the other thing that I was thinking of is whenever we have like a really big headline, it's like it blows up our news space. You know oh. what I mean? Like. You know, we're we're dropping bombs on the headlines this week, you know, and then we play the noise and we have to find some excuse to play it like once a week. I, I'm with you. Uh, if you guys have suggestions, uh, drop it in the comments, tweet at us. Uh, we're we're going to have a lot of fun <laughs> about this. All right, let's go to the bad feeling mailbag. I got a bad feeling about this. I have a bad feeling about this. I've got a bad feeling about okay. this. Quiet. Whoa. We actually got a significant amount of uh, people throwing throwing some questions our way. So lead us off there, Charmer. Yeah, first, I, I just want to thank everybody for participating, especially because this is our inaugural episode. So uh, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. But uh, first up from Colot Informant on Twitter, they asked, knowing what we know about the leaked rules, do you think it is going to be important for units to uh, be both ground and space, or do you think players will ultimately choose to just race in one arena? And you and I had kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but I I will let you lead off before I give a, a little bit more detail, because I do think this is an interesting question. It is, and this sort of leads to the, the same kind of mentality that you may have in other card games. When you talk about race, yeah, you're basically trying to get to your win condition or get to the outcome of the game as fast as possible, ignoring your opponents. You are confident in the fact that what I'm doing is going to be more efficiently or is going to more efficiently accelerate my progress towards, a win, towards winning the game faster than my opponent is. Um, in Star Wars CCG, that was definitely an option. However, Star Wars yeah. CCG had a plethora of mitigating options where you could do that. Let's say you want to go all ground and your opponent is all space. You could do that. You're like, look, I'm just going to beat you because I don't care about space. My deck, my ground deck strategy is so efficient and so powerful that you can do you can do whatever the hell you want and i'm just going to get there faster however most decks that would do that typically had ran cards that would mitigate the the efficiency and the effectiveness of the, the your opponent's strategies like like you do your thing i'm going to do my thing but doesn't mean i'm going to throw i'm not going to throw my garbage over the fence at you and there were cards like that like in star wars ccg force training if you were left to your own devices you're either running an engine <laughs> yeah an engine related kind of deck that was basically saying, I don't need you here. I'm going to punish you with bonuses without you here. And if you do show up, I'm going to punish you harder. So it's, it's lose or lose harder. But at the same time, there's that's that as a strategy was well aware from the decipher people. And they implemented an immense amount of cards that, were live on the board untouchable as it were that that slowed down your the opponent's progress towards that so that's the long-winded way to say i think that you in order to win this game you have to you cannot ignore one aspect you have to you could it's it's cool to go 90 percent ground but if your 10 percent in space isn't a disruptive effect that can that takes your opponent significant resources to address then you're not going to get there i think that if they're designing this game with two separate things they're designing it with the with the intention of interactivity yeah so i kind of want to echo that i will say i think that there will likely be because there are always pitfalls in any card game at some point there will likely be one deck that does figure out a way to be hyper efficient and just go one lane and that's your thing 
right? I could definitely see a world where, you know, again, for example, maybe it's a throw on deck and you've got a bunch of air units and you just try to dominate space and like that's your thing. But from a design standpoint and again, that idea of like living your fantasy, but also just good game design core mechanics where you want there to be a tug of war and this back and forth. I think that they're going to very much promote you to interact in both areas and have a back and forth between the players. Like a great example would be maybe there's a battle droid deck. And so you're going to have like the battle droids from the space station and then the ones on the ground, right? And rebels, you're going to have X-Wings, you're going to have rebel forces. Same thing, you're going to have stormtroopers and you're going to have TIE fighters. I think that they're going to give you enough tools where you're not 100% in one direction or the other. Would not be shocked if at some point in the game's history there is one deck that does it, but I don't think that that will be the norm. I, I tend to agree. I tend to agree. Uh, next question is coming from uh, Darth Prentice. Uh, Greg, a friend of many of our projects, a great, great person, great individual, uh, who may or may not have a hand in the audio engineering of this show. So <laughs> a great, great human being. Will Dice be involved? Charmer, will Dice be involved? There's no mention of Dice in the quick start rules. So I'm going to say yes anyway. And uh, I'm going to say this for two reasons. One, I think that at some point it's just going to be, even if it's not a core mechanic, it's going to be something that co comes up on a card, right? Like we might have like Watto's Gamble where you roll a die to see if you get to keep Anakin or his mom or something. Right? Wow, like, that just, is dark, dude. <laughs> you're you're going to have it. Uh, but at a minimum, we do know that this is a game based on the quick start rules where damage is persistent on the characters. And so I suspect at your local game store, you're going to see a lot of people tracking damage with dice. So that's my cheat answer. Okay, here's my answer to this. Um, I was on the fence about this for a while, but at first I said no. And the reason I said no, because Star Wars CCG um, handled RNG with Destiny drawing it off the top it was actually a manipulatable random element if you were and it was part of card balance correct it was absolutely part of card balance it was an additional metric where if a card, like all of your main characters or most of them had the balancing aspect of having a low destiny number so when you had to draw a card off the top if something said like draw destiny add that number to your total power all if you just stacked your deck with all the strongest characters, you were drawing ones all the time. Whereas a lot of the um, support cards were like three, four, five, six. So that's where you you had to balance it. Now, there's no destiny number on this. There's like a deploy cost, from what I understand. Uh, but how do you mitigate random effects? So in my fir my first suspicion was, well, there are none. There's definitely none. But then I was thinking more along the lines of what if there are characters like there are in many games that like to roll dice, that like to take chances, that are very feast or famine like brutes in Flesh and Blood. And I was like, well, what would kind of lead me to that? And in my head was gamblers, Lando, yeah. Han Solo, um, you know. Um, Got to whip out some Sabacc and settle that somehow. Dude, um, Han's even, dice is a, a relic of the Star Wars universe. Yeah, but I'll even go a step further. You know, I hadn't considered the idea of just keeping something around to resolve randomized effects. One of the revealed cards, Tarkin, has an ability where you look at the top five cards of your deck and you can choose up to two Imperial units and you put them in your hand, and then the rest of the cards that you don't select go on the bottom of your deck. Now, when I first read that card, I just assumed that it would be in an order of your choosing because I've been playing Flesh and Blood for so long and I'm so used to that. But I double-checked this morning to prepare for the show, and it's in a random order. So you're already going to have to like use probably a, a, a die to randomize how those are going on the, the bottom of your deck when you activate Tarkin. There you have it. Darth Prentice. Thank you, Greg. Uh, what's next? Uh, the next question is one of two from Seven Foot. Uh, their Twitter handle is actually JCC string of numbers, but they, uh, they're they Seven Foot. So uh, 
Many Star Wars books from Lucasfilms Press have uh, an expensive, I, I think this was meant to be expansive universe. Or uh, extensive. It could be, it could yeah, be, it could be expensive or, or expansive, either or. Uh, it's definitely not expensive, though some of the Star Wars stuff is rather pricey. Dude, I've been uh, trying to I've been trying to find a hard a hardcover <laughs> copy of Tarkin, the book Tarkin, for so long, and you can't get one. Uh, it's just no, impossible. They're, they're super uh, expensive. Uh, to, so to get back on track, um, the Luke's Films Press they've got a, a number of the titles that are canon to the main seven movies, like old new trilogy Rogue One. Uh, they ask, who is the mutant that would divert? from such a plethora of material to make movies that ignore years of universe building. Are there any books from Lucasfilms press you would like to see a movie from? So if you're not familiar, if you're somebody who is, you know, watched star Wars films, uh, TV shows, but maybe you've never read the books. Uh, there were a number of books that were written that took place after, um, you know, a new hope empire strikes back return of the Jedi. Right? So it's Luke, restarting the Jedi order. This is where we get introduced to Mara Jade in the books. And then there's like Luke's clone, uh, where it's his name spelled with two U's. And if you hear the disdain in my voice, it's cause that was one of my least favorite storylines from that. Uh, but we also had other characters who ended up getting like their own video games, right? We had dash Rendar, um, Thrawn originally came from some of these series as well. And we know that he is now, uh, made his return in rebels and is going to make a live action debut. But, the Thrawn in Rebels, for example, is different from the Thrawn in the books. Now, he is very similar in terms of character design and personality, but the stuff that happens in those books is not considered canon anymore. It's not part of the story. So uh, Seven Foot is essentially asking, like, who would get rid of all of that? And I'm, I'm going to maybe give an unpopular opinion, but I think it was the right call because... There is a lot of information in those books. And when they decided to tackle it on the big screen, I think that either you were going to upset people if they didn't follow them explicitly, or you are going to expect audiences to know all of that knowledge. And so I think it feels better to keep the spirit of many of those characters, but do it in its own way. Well, another part of this is the fact that... I still that, need Mara Jade, though. Well, yeah, Mara right. Jade, like... And, and this is, I think, that... Like, Thrawn's back. Thrawn came back. In fact, they actually... So Thrawn first appeared in Heir to the Empire by Timothy Zahn, like, in the 90s or something like that. Yeah. It was so well-received. It's probably the best Star Wars trilogy book uh, book series that has ever been written. Um, if you haven't read it, even though it's not canon, I highly recommend it because it is, it, it is basically the birth of of Grand Admiral Thrawn um, and the, the entire Chiss race and people. The thing about it is that this character was so good that when when if you're looking at timelines, when Disney acquired Lucasfilm and started that, hey, we're going to start doing some new stuff. What they basically did is like there's so much of a mess that that we're acquiring here that we need to, like you said, is just reboot and start fresh. And I think that's an actually a good thing. And what they did was they said, okay, what is canon is the movies and whatever is being printed from now on, which included comic books, video games, any media that they were going to be printing from the, the date of acquisition or from whatever they said. It's like it's now and every, everything else is not is not canon. So that might piss a lot of people off. But what they did immediately was like, let's go get Timothy Zahn back because we need a fresh new story for Thrawn uh, that is going to fit into our grander scheme of what we want to do. And let's see if he's down to write another three or four Thrawn books. And he's like, hell yeah. So I'm not worried about it from that perspective of like, well, look, they just flushed a whole lot of amazing stories down the tube. And to me, Mara Jade is absolutely one of them. Um, the entire Rogue Squadron series of books by Michael A. Stackpole yeah. are another incredible. Um, the entire, um, not Dash Rendar, uh, Corrin Horn, like the like a character like Corrin Horn, who's supposed to be on Wedge Antilles level of piloting skills. Dash Rendar, like the Shadows of the Empire, like these are not technically canon anymore. But it doesn't mean that they won't be. And I think that the fact that they brought back Thrawn, which was a fan favorite, and rightfully so, also opens the door to Disney and whoever owns Star Wars or whatever, who's ever running the show there, to say, you know what? 
Like we have our plate, our plates are full, but this is not a brand or an IP that is ever going to run out of steam. So if, and I can, I guarantee you if they have a bad year, the first thing that they're going to do is like drop a, tra- a teaser trailer or something where like it's Mara Jade, but not Luke's wife, Mara Jade, not. No, I think they have to start her like on the dark side. Well, like, you know the, what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, in the books, she loses her force powers, right? And Luke tries to revive her, like, try to, like, revive her force powers to a degree. And what's fascinating about that is, like, in order to do this, he's like, let's have a little lightsaber battle, like a little fun thing. And in the books, at one point, he feels a flash of the force in her as they're fighting. Like, it, it reawakens it. But he's like, but it was the dark side. Like, he felt, right. yeah, and I was like, oh, that's so cool. So maybe, yeah, you like, again, yeah. you could reimagine it. I Well, I just, one of the reasons I fell in love with her just in general was, uh, again, it, it's something that's been done several times in the universe for Star Wars now, but she was my first introduction to this idea of a secret apprentice, right? So, like, the idea that she was the Emperor's hand behind the scenes and was like training to be the new Vader when the time came. And like, I just, I fell in love with that character. And then when she was added to the, the star Wars uh, decipher game, and that was the first time I saw a purple lightsaber. Cause that was pre Mace Windu. Mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, I'm, I am in, I can have a purple lightsaber. Like, yes, please. Thank you. Um, I, and I remember when we very first got to see Mace Windu's purple lightsaber, I had so many like conspiracy theories about how he was going to be secretly a, a Sith Lord because purple, like that was the only time I'd seen it was with Mara. I was like, purple's supposed to be like a dark side lightsaber, you know, because they'd always been separated and, and then you annoyed many friends back then. And then you, <laughs> and then you figured out it was literally just Samuel Jackson saying, uh, no, I want a purple one. And yeah, I want to see myself in the big fight scenes yeah. and purple is regal, which also like hats off. It worked. Well, it was iconic. It was because that kind of, I think that also kind of launched the entire discussion of like, what does a yellow one mean? What does a blue one mean? What does a green one mean? Like uh, the, the, the iconic kind of like clip of Samuel Jackson negotiating with George Lucas, like on set, where he's like, oh, can it be purple? I want it to be. And he's like, no, it can't be purple. Good guys are green and blue. Like he didn't say, oh, well, there's blue, which means, uh, you know, this yeah. or that. There's green. That means like wisdom or whatever. I don't know what they mean, like uh, off the top of my head. But now there's like, there's yellow. There's, there's, uh, you know, there's like Plo Koon yeah. has a yellow I, one. I will and- say something that also used to like fry my brain. I used to think that, again, just like you were saying, there was like got to be meanings behind the colors, right? So something that fried my brain when I was younger, whenever I'd watch Star Wars, is I was like, all right, why is the, the good guy's lightsaber green, bad guy's red, but then when you fly the starships, TIE fighters shot green lasers and X-wings shot red. And like I couldn't wrap my my brain around it. I distinctly remember like being so confused as a kid when I was first shown that. Like, why? Why is it different in space? Because the rebellion are terrorists and they're bad people. Did you know the Empire did nothing wrong? Now the person at the head of it may have been evil, but as a whole, they brought order to the galaxy. Derek Oswald. But maybe. Well, and then and this is also why I love the show Andor so much because then we actually get to see the real oppression. Yes, in that, action. Like well, Andor is so good too. Oh man, it's a really awesome dichotomy of Rogue One and Andor because Rogue One came up first. Obviously, it is in my mind one of the, it's probably the second best Star Wars movie that's ever been made. But the important part about it is that it really shed light on the gritty nature, the take no prisoners, like we can't afford witnesses, we have to get this done, just ruthless nature uh, you know of the rebellion at the time which was work in the shadows kill everybody who gets in our way we have an objective like they were the they were the greasy ones they were the actual like yeah dangerous ones but then you move on and you're like oh wow wow they're, they're really like like okay i'm still with it but like they're not like uh, you know they're not opposed to murdering and in their informants they're this they're that like they're not as uh righteous as they're made out to oh, be it's because i think that that was also the first time that we got to actually see spies in action because in the previous films, 
we talk about spies, but we don't get to see what goes into being a spy, right? Like <laughs> we we hear like, about a, a Rogue One. Rogue One is when we essentially get to see the CIA of the rebellion, right? And so, like, yeah, it's in theory for the greater good, but you're doing some very dark, sinister, shady, potentially unethical stuff, right? It's that entire concept of you know, do the ends justify the means? And it's not even just with them, but then you also see the other extremism with like Saw Gerrera, for example. So like Rogue One introduced a lot of that. And then on the other side, Rogue One also like introduced us to how the Empire could force good people to do bad things as well. And I just, man, I love that movie so much. In my mind, like the, when you say spies, the first thing I think is like, many Bothans died bringing the, it's like, and I'm like, okay, so there's spies, and they just said, they're like, yeah, we just like, we literally just pointed a, a, a boatload of them right into the sun. Like, right. It's such a throwaway line, right? And I think that's, again, uh, just speaks to Rogue One because that line, it's kind of iconic, but I'd never really thought about like how it played out. It was just like, oh, they sent a bunch of people on a mission and some came back. And then you see Rogue One, and I'm like, all right, now I need to know what happened with the Bothan because yeah. if it's anything like this, like this is way more intense than i had ever imagined you know a spy operation in the in the star wars universe so. yeah it wasn't theft of information to the same degree where we like this ragtag group infiltrated uh, a base on scarif and got the information this is like every bothan that you've ever met and known is dead and no longer yeah, exists. I, I imagine the bothan one as like a heist movie right it's both and spies but because it's specifically like they sent in this group it to me it's like <laughs> it's like all right oceans like, 11 <laughs> right it's, i was gonna say who's the who's who of who can break into something and that's why they died right it's oceans 11 but it goes bad halfway through oh my god i can see that like i can honestly see Oceans 11 <laughs> dude that how good would that be like you have and just bring back the cash. Bring back, bring back like George Clooney and Matt Damon, and you know, like bring them all but back. Just Bothan. All as Bothans, and you know, Andy Garcia is like the the is like the imperial, imperial like officer. Yeah, get up. Yeah. Oh my god! And they're like, I was gonna say a casino, but they did that. That's called Canto Bite. But we're not going to talk about that. All right. I think I think we've uh, successfully. Uh, flown this uh you know <laughs> we we definitely didn't bring this in in an, in like under 12 parsecs like we probably should have but uh i i thought that this was a successful opening episode my friend and i'm so excited that this is just one of many as this we're just getting launched on this journey yeah we haven't even wrapped this one up and i'm already excited for the next episode i, I know i am just filled to the brim with joy for this project so all right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, that wraps up the first episode of Wampa Radio. We want to thank you again for submitting your questions to the Bad Feeling Mailbag. Uh, and if you want to contact us, uh, you can always reach out to the podcast at Wampa Radio. You can go to Wampa Radio Podcast at gmail.com if you want to send us something that way. As well as uh, I am at Watch Flake on Twitter. And then you have at That Charmer, C H A R M 3 R. Yeah, um, because I'm edgy and I have numbers where letters belong because I'm like a droid. That's true. I never thought about it that way. Look at you. All <laughs> right. Oh, okay. Well, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for listening to Wampa Radio. We'll catch you next time. Uh, I don't know what a sign off is going to be for now, but we're just going to end it on this. <laughs> <laughs>